Hi, everybody. Wow, it's Purim all over again, and boy, can I not wait. It's the best, first of all, to be able to fast, not the right before the actual holiday, uh, and then have Shabbos to recuperate after the fast is also exciting for me. So we have to count our blessings this year. Um, And I'm just going to touch upon some of the teachings of uh, the Alter Rebbe in Torah Or regarding the journey of the soul, uh, which was translated by the Hasidic Heritage Series, and then go and connect it to uh, information um, coming from the mystery of marriage and how it's connected to our love and relationships. First of all, um, we know that Queen Esther, uh, Mordechai, and King Ahasuerus are really the symbol of the soul and its journey to um, get to its destination of closeness and unity uh, with Hashem. Mordechai represents the Torah. And if you've seen the Megillah, it's all about Mordechai taking Esther, raising her, and then eventually telling her what to do. And that represents the soul really needing the Torah to be able to be directed and guided how to get to its ultimate destination of total unity with Hashem. Believe it or not, King Ahasuerus represents Hashem. And the uh, Queen Esther, as well as the maidens, um, represents the soul wanting to get ready to be close to Hashem. So the job of preparation that was done by the Amadians was putting mirth oil and oil representing wisdom and like letting the wisdom of Hashem's Torah seep in internally like oil gets uh, is able to sink in the one's skin um, and make it soft because uh, the wisdom of Hashem's Torah helps make our heart soft. The maidens were um, putting perfumes on, and the perfumes actually represent uh, mitzvos, uh, just like uh, perfume is outside of you and um, actually connected to like a sense of smell that's outside of you. The mitzvos that you do that are outside of you beautify you and make you feel um, uh, enhanced and, and smell good. And... Um, and and particularly in Torah or the Rebbe the Alter Rebbe actually focuses his attention on the two points in the Megillah where Queen Esther actually does approach the king. The first episode is in chapter five where she's about to um try to convince the king uh, and she has this like this plot. And while she's there, she's at the courtyard. She's not in the inner chambers, and the king hands her the scepter, and the scepter, she's able to just touch the tip of the scepter. Um, The Altarabi explains that the scepter represents the channel by which godliness can be brought into the world. And when you're in the courtyard, you really cannot receive the whole scepter. That's why it points out that she just touches the the tip of the scepter. And most particularly, the radiance is represented by the gold. Because gold, well, it's shining and bright, but it also has a tint of red. And red represents like fire and passion. So in the beginning, it's not like you can have like such a fiery passion and be able to really just uh, have it all in your relationship with Hashem, Um, especially if you're like yet not at the stage where one is more and more humbled and and modest. Um, And this represents the second stage when when, um, Queen Esther goes to the actual chambers of the king. Now she's like beyond the courtyard. And there it says she falls to the ground. 
and 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 then the king gives her the scepter and she holds on to the scepter and and the king raises her up by the scepter so here is the second stage the first stage was like almost the primitive stage in our relationship to Hashem, like the beginning stages of trying to get close to him, understanding that, that you know, everything has to go in progress. Too much, too quickly can be overwhelming. So um, the second stage is where you're more able to get to that c- closer position. But in order to really secure that that position, you have to almost remove yourself from self by falling to the ground, which represented her like like being that bitter and humble and, and egoless state of existence, meaning like I'm so to the ground, I'm not even here. So then, because of that level, she's able to rise and get to the real self and get to that close unity with Hashem. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so, I want to bring out that it it was like, there was a question of like, why in the beginning she didn't um, say like, right up front, right? You could see it was like a slow progress. If she would have just gone straight in and there, she might not have gotten to that closeness uh, of her mission. Um, so, so the idea is as follows. There are teachings that she didn't want the Jewish people to totally rely on her. She wanted to share in the responsibility of having merit, of being worthy, of being able to be saved, because... She wanted the Jewish people also to say, well, why doesn't she go and tell right away? What is she doing? Maybe she's scared. Maybe she's not going to go tell. Maybe we can't rely on her. Let's fast. Let's do this. Let's pray. Let's do more learning and what have you. But really, the, the yes, that's that's true, but, it, but, but we have to see the bigger picture of this process of her coming to that place of being so united by Hashem. Uh, and ready for it. Now, if you look at when she did approach the king the second time, after having fallen to the ground, she cried bitterly, saying, like, you know, um, I, you know, this decree of Haman, please get it out of my life. Meaning Haman represented the Yetzirah, the challenges, the temptations. She was just like wanting already to like get free of that. That's like the, the soul crying to Hashem, I can't stand the Yetzirah anymore. And that has a great impact when we have this kind of um, this firm desire and yearning to, to really be free, to be the best that we can be. Because that has the power, actually, the Tanya says, to like really break the klipas and break us free from um, from our negativity and our yetaharas and our temptations. Now, now I'm going to focus on this idea of the falling to the ground business. This meaning like, what does falling to the ground mean and removing yourself from your own self? To be so humble, to be able to reach even a higher level of humbleness called modesty. And in chapter 15 of Mystery and Marriage, on page 371, in Derach Eretz Zuta, there's a sentence that says, the splendor of Torah is wisdom. The splendor of wisdom is humility. The splendor of humility is awe. The splendor of awe is a mitzvah. The splendor of mitzvah is its modesty. So we see here, like the whole purpose that we should be learning Torah is that should we should be wise, and the whole purpose of being wise is that we should have humility, and the whole purpose of us having humility is so that we'll be like, you know, like, like wow, Hashem is so great, and who am I, you know, humble, and the whole purpose 
of having this awe is that then we'll feel like, wow, Hashem is so great and He's asking us to do these mitzvahs. Of course we're going to do the mitzvahs. So the whole purpose why God wants us to do the mitzvahs is to reach a level of modesty. So we're going to focus our attention on what's the difference between humbleness and the higher level, which is the ultimate goal of the Torah and the mitzvahs, is to reach a level of modesty. And by the way, we know it has been told uh, of man what is good, what does God ask of you, only that you do justice, love kindness, and walk modestly with your God. That's like basically what, why we're here. So, so the question is, why is modesty really the, the crux and the, like the climax of our divine service? the apex of our, our ultimate goal in our serving Hashem. So first we have to see what does mitzvahs mean and what is modesty? What's the meaning behind being honest? Well, mitzvahs we know mean attachment or connection. And there's duties between God and man, and there's duties between man and man. When we do a mitzvah, we connect to God. Our soul bonds with Hashem's soul. When we do an act of kindness and are loving and sweet and giving to man, then we're attaching our soul to that soul and God. So when we relate to other people, we have to relate to them in a modest way. Most people think modesty is the way one dresses, which is true and very important. But modesty also means your actions. How are you moving? How are you talking to them? Are you overly self-absorbed that your ego is uh, taking over and you're speaking with such an I stance? Are you too much overly referring yourself uh, in the, uh, to yourself? Are your thoughts constantly having an exaggerated self-image of how important you are and how your thinking is the right thinking, how it should go your way? Modesty is not thinking so much about yourself at all. So modesty is trying to have a negation of this self-focus Because when you're deliberately attempting to nullify yourself, this is an act of humility, and it's different than the level of modesty. Humble person, in trying to nullify himself, there's still an I that's trying to get rid of this self selfishness. There's an I that wants to be better. There's an I that wants to be humble. Modesty is not even thinking about yourself. Modesty is transcending yourself. There was a famous story of a man who was about to pass away, and he was really perturbed, and everyone looked at him like, what's going on? You're such a tzaddik. You're going to Ghana Eden. Like, that's where they were thinking. Why are you so nervous? Like, and they asked him, he said, I don't know if I'm going to go to Ghana Eden or not. I've been so, he was so busy not thinking about himself and doing so many things for everybody else. He never had time to think about himself. Like if it came from a good place, was it his ego? Was it because he liked the attention? Whatever. He just really felt like, wow, this is a story about modesty, being so unself-absorbed. So... Basically, modesty is about totally orienting yourself toward divinity, toward Hashem, toward what Hashem wants. And this level of service reaches one's highest super conscious aspects of his soul. And I'll explain. Since a person almost removes himself from his self. It's like he's attaching himself to all the higher powers up in Shemaim. Because the superconscious powers are not attached to any part of the body. 
So when you move yourself from the I and the I want and it's what I think is right, and you're like, you know, I'm not going to focus so much in my behaviors toward other people on, on myself. I'll just more focus on Hashem's will, having reliance on Him and 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 not being too enmeshed with my ego while trying to do the right thing and try to guide my children or try to elevate my husband. Like I have to, I'm going to really try that it's not coming from a personal need or a personal tactic so that I'll like have nachas for my children or I'll feel good that my husband makes me feel good or whatever the story is. It's like I really want to do a l'shem shemaim and and try my best to move away from me in it. Then it's like you're moving away from yourself, so then you're attaching yourself to the super conscious level of your soul. So, and this level of nothingness actually lets you have a feeling of weightlessness because it's like, it's not all you. You know, there's a pasuk in Nun He of uh, Tehillim, Hashlech Lasham Yavcha Vuye Kalkelecha. Like, you know, you can send your burdens, also your spiritual burdens to Hashem. Like, it's not all about you uh, succeeding in, in becoming a better person, you managing to have the best children raised, whatever. Your spiritual sustenance. Because kakala means sustenance. But kakala also means a keli, your vessel of being able to reach higher and higher levels of of uh, spirituality and and uh, and transcendence, you can send it to Hashem. So, so this highest level of super consciousness actually lets the person tap into such wisdom as well. And it says from in the Pasuk, in the verse from Yermiahu, God appeared to me from afar. Meaning the more I removed myself and felt so far away from Hashem, like Queen Esther falling to the ground, the more Hashem appears to you. It's like allowing there to be space. So then God can be there. And um, I think it was actually today's Tanya that Hashem does not like to be in a fragmented place or in a place where it's just full of ego. Fragmented meaning disunity, meaning like you have your own values and your vision of how things should be and then you don't like what they are thinking and how it should be preceded and then you have disunity and it, and it eats you up alive and and so then you're like you're not wholesome you're not being able to really include the other you know there's a muscle of the womb and the womb makes space for now and expands so that the baby can be in the mother's womb so technically speaking, spiritually, we have to expand ourselves to be able to include other people and their vision and what they think and 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 then really be united with them, even though they have different uh, ideologies even in the way they think they should serve Hashem or raise the children or whatever it is. Yeah. So there's another pasuk that uh, King Shomo said, I shall become wise, but it was far from me. So when I become bittal, when I don't take me so seriously and like uh, humble myself to a place of like being so far from Hashem, that's where wisdom will come to me. And now Rabbi Ginsburg brings out a couple of stories in the Tanakh that that will help a person realize um, this is our journey. To become a nothing. And by becoming a nothing, we really find ourselves. So, the one of the stories is the story of um, Yaakov as he's about to get his blessings. Rivka knows that in order to really actualize blessings in life, 
you really have to reach a place of nothingness. So she tells Yaakov, dress up, put Esau's clothing on, move away from who you are, hide yourself. By hiding yourself, you'll be able to achieve the actualizations of all these blessings that God wants to give you. Now, the dressing up actually is symbolic in, in Purim. We're dressing up to hide ourselves, to reach a level of nothingness, of reaching the level like Esther falling to the ground. Also, the drinking in Purim, you're supposed to drink ad de lo yada, until you don't know who you are anymore. Until like, am I this or am I that? I'm like moving so far away from me knowing who I am that I'm running away from myself almost. And in that way, that's when I'm going to be able to allow my soul to be able to receive all that is going to help me be me, the real me, the godly me. So, also when Esau was dressing, when Yaakov was dressing, dressing up like Esau, he was also including all the people in the future generations that even though they were acting like an Aesop, outer behaviors that were so disconnected to the true self that they too will be able to get these blessings because really they are so holy and so pure deep down inside. So the next story is brought um, with uh, Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu asked Hashem, please, please, let me see your face. And Hashem says, well, you can't see my face. You can only see my back. What is this all about? Hashem is saying, look, what's my real pleasure? My inner essence is... In essence, my face. My inner essence is that I love you so much. And like, you are me. So the way you're going to connect to me and see my mm-hmm. face is by looking at your back. Meaning, in like, my outer behaviors and my, my temptations in the world, that's like the outer me, right? But the inner me is on my back side almost. Like, it's like the back, I have to find my back. I have to find my inner essence, what's deep inside of me. And by me finding what's my innermost super conscious uh, levels, then I will be able to see Hashem. Because there is where I am, Hashem is saying. There is where you will see me. Only by seeing your back will you see my face. Also, the story with uh, Boaz. So, Ruth was, as we know, was uh, so modest in the way she was picking up the leftover uh, produce. And all of a sudden, because she was so modest, Boaz actually saw how special she was. So it says here, he recognized her as being a stranger. But how can you recognize her as being a stranger? And it says here that because it was almost uh, at a level of strangeness, like, because it wasn't, it was, she wasn't acting like all the other people. That she was really so modest that that brought out her beauty and brought out her specialness. It actually brought Boaz's attention. So, so in order to really get the whole scepter from the king. In order to be raised by God, we really need to move away from ourselves and make room for God to be able to be part of us to, and, and allow his essence to like, you know, jumpstart our inner essence 
and be able to go forward. And this has everything also to do with marriage. That's why this is in the marriage book. I quote it here. That the whole purpose of creation of man is to cling to one's spouse and become one with them and relate to their spouse at the highest level of their common soul root. And in order for one to do that, in order to really find your spouse, you have to find your real self. Now, in order to really find your real self, you have to transcend yourself. And then when you transcend yourself, then you'll be able to find your spouse. Because you really can't know your spouse until you really know your inner essence. So in order to, like we want to find God, and we can't really find God until we like move away from ourselves, the same thing with marriage. The more we're humble, the more we're modest, we'll find our true self. And when we find our true self, we'll have the ability to see the true self in the other. And by knowing the true self of the other, then we begin to be able to be our true self because our mate is our other half. We're missing that half. We were saying last week, and since you weren't here last week, that that the husband has a level of wisdom that the wife doesn't, and the wife has a level of wisdom that the husband doesn't. They're incomplete. And the woman has, like from her name, Isha Hay, Hay representing the five levels of wisdom, of strength, and the Ish has the letter Yud, and that letter Yud has represents ten, and she has ten. He has ten faculties of wisdom, but his ten are undeveloped. You know, the Yud is very puny looking, and the Hay is like grounded and expansive. So by acting kindly to one another, by sharing special moments together, by physically kissing and, and, and having union, each other's qualities meld and mend and become one. And each and the other begin to raise each other up, especially in learning Torah together. Because the learning Torah together allows Hashem's fire to mamish wrap around the two souls and his holy fire starts to meld them into one. And so what's missing in the other becomes the others. So the um cute story I was uh, reading on an email that there was a a woman and she's like constantly getting really annoyed honking because the person in front of her is going so slow and she's like late for work and the the, I'm embellishing a little bit I can imagine she's like you know so bothered because you know she already got forewarned if she's ever late again she might be fired from her job they can't handle it anymore And, like, all of a sudden, it was a yellow light right in the beginning, and the car dead stop stops in front of her, and, like, she's now really annoyed. He could have made it. She could have also made it. And and, And she's, like, starting to roll down her window, like, what did you do? Scream. And her eyes, hands are wavering. And, um, next thing you know, the police come to her and say, please give me your registration. Give me this. Give me that. And they take her to jail. So she's like, what did I do? I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah. They go, they do search all the documents, and they all of a sudden realize um, they made a mistake. So they come to her and say, I apologize that this has happened to you. I'm so sorry. But you see, we I was tailgating you this whole time, 
and I was noticing your bumper stickers, peace on earth, love, unity, and harmony, and like all these interesting, beautiful, you know, stickers. And when you were ranting and raving and so uh, disrespectful and, uh, and, and behaving in an unpeaceful manner, we thought you stole the car. So basically, can you imagine? But basically, this is the dichotomy of our day-to-day life. Our inner essence believes in those those people. I don't know. I got in an email somewhere, but I'm just saying it's a it's a dichotomy of a sort because here we are like those stickers. We believe in peace and harmony and this. It's our our innermost essence goals, and we can even plaster it on our car. But then at the moment of our Yetzirah and the temptations of life events, boom, our ideology goes out the window. So the idea is how do we get to, to more balance who we really are with our outer garments, our outer behaviors. The beginning step is falling to the ground like Esther does. Getting to that level of wisdom, more and more wisdom that helps us see clearly that we are nothing. Chochmah comes from the word koachma, that it's really God's world. He's directing everything. All we are, like trying our best, is to manage every day's day with um, with an understanding of we're just going to do the best we can with the tools we have, but God's directing. He's managing. He's responsible. And then the person gets less anxious, less heavy-hearted, less burdened by life. And then there's a weightlessness of a sort because I, I, I'm... I have someone helping me. There's a beautiful, um, a beautiful teaching. Hi. In um, one of my, in the letter of ages, where it says. that really the person who feels all alone has so much on his shoulders, he's so overwhelmed by the responsibilities, so he feels he's carrying all the burdens on his shoulders. And then that leads him to such an attitude of of, of tension, and the person then ends up having so much anxiety, and so they don't really believe that really there's this God up in Shemaim that's going to help them, and they then tend to not share their problems with Hashem. And then they view their environment as hostile and threatening. And so there's so much pressure that his entire world has to have attention and reactions, and like he's the captain of the ship, and oh my gosh, there's so much of a headache from it all. And then so much tension and stress that he ends up shouting back, raising his voice, and uh, and 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 has a, like a threatening energy because they're so overwhelmed. But otherwise, because they don't have this strong faith that Hashem is always there, watching over and taking care of them then it seems like everything is 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 like uh like if I don't take care of it it's gonna be uh, you know like chaos like take a deep breath it doesn't have to be right away think it clearly Hashem is with you say it to him and let yourself free yourself from the burdens of the responsibilities of everything that would be great so A person that really has faith and and knows that Hashem is constantly with him, he's able to share his worries and his woes with Hashem, and then he'll be able to be more calm and composed, 
And then he'll be able to display this by his calm and soft and gentle manner of speaking. But if he's so frazzled and so unmodest because he thinks he's the one that's going to make the difference or not make the difference by the way he's going to react, and blah, 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 then it shows in his voice he can't be calm. But when he's not keeping up, but like sharing the burdens with Hashem, as we said, and actually says here, cast upon Hashem your burden and he will sustain you. He will never allow the faltering of the righteous. Because a wise man remains in control under all the circumstances. And if others speaking to him, he quietly listens and then quietly responds and addresses them. He's able to think more clearly. And there's a beautiful uh, teaching here that it says, I am nice but firm, pleasant but resolute, delightful but determined, cordial but tenacious, respectful but unyielding, gracious but immutable. I may not be able to control other people or situations, but I can always control my attitude. When you're not so much in the picture, when you're more modest and humble, like almost to the ground, who am I? What am I all in this? Then you have the ability to have a better attitude about it all because you know that you're nothing. You know, they say that, uh, and I've said this before in uh, previous classes, that Rebbe brought out this teaching, why was David Melech nor Avram Avinu privileged to get the Torah? They were great giants. They were pillars of, of righteousness. But Moshe Rabbeinu got the Torah. David Melech and Abraham spoke in these terms. Abraham said, and I am as dust. There was an I and there was a dust, something. Dr. Melech said, and I am but a worm. There's an I and a worm that is something. Moshe Rabbeinu, when the Jewish people were complaining to him, like, what are you doing? Why are you taking us out here? No food, no water, whatever, hello. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu said, the anachnuma. There was no such thing as I. It wasn't an I. It was Vanachnu. I'm just part of Hashem's plan. I'm just a chariot doing what Hashem wants. Vema. What am I? It's not me. It's all Hashem. And Ma actually represents a level of godliness. Ma is one, the essence of your soul that's so connected to Hashem. And it actually spells out Hashem's name, yud ke vav when you do the Yud, yud vav Dalet, and all the different uh, uh, spellings equal 45. And 45 equals Ma. And I just want to leave you with this, that um, there's a pasuk that says, Me'ayin yavo Izri. It's a beautiful Shira Ma'alos. Uh and a beautiful song. I wish I could sing it like the author, but... So the idea is, where is my help going to come from? A person who like, has so many challenges, so many... The hardships. Oh my gosh! I was just went to visit someone in the hospital yesterday. She has oh, just unbelievable. So many children who are not well. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So ayin is also from where will my health come? Ayin also means nothingness. When I get to a place of nothingness and don't self-absorb and self-focus on everything that's going wrong in my life then that's where my Ezri will come. That's where I become a spacious 
entity to allow God to reside in me and take care of me and, and help me in my life. So may we get to that place of Abdeloyada, not to even know ourselves, to be a place where we're so far even away from ourselves and not get there necessarily by only drinking, but by doing this uh, soul searching and see where can we be more modest in the way we speak, in the way we dress, the way we can move ourselves from self and Bezrat Hashem, reach that level of getting to know the real self. All right, have a beautiful rest of the... Yes. Yes. Yes, if there's a change, yes. Thank Thank you. you. Have a beautiful, beautiful Chag Purim Sameach. Get dressed up. And by getting dressed up, hide yourself from yourself. And uh, just mamish be besimcha. Hashem is with us. All right, bye-bye, everyone. Um, Bye.